important. The second thing that I think you have to realize, and putting it into context and framework, is it's not easy. You know, Americans have grown to become accustomed to a 30-second solution. You know, you, you expect great customer service right now in a consumer society. You expect corporations to deliver you quarterly results. And if the quarterly results don't meet expectation, the company will take a severe beating at, on the stock market the following day. We are, we are into instant gratification. And in the world of international affairs, that reality is very, very different. And this, again, is why you need to have the discourse. We need to accept the fact that this is hard and it's not easy. You know, in, in my time on the Intelligence Committee, I, I've had the opportunity to travel to 80 different countries. Uh, and it's like, you know, most of them, they are interesting places to go. But in most cases, I would not have gone there uh, if I hadn't had the opportunity to go with American security, by being an official of the U.S. government. Uh, and so you go to Turkmenistan, you go to Uzbekistan, you go to Afghanistan, you go to Iraq, you go to Pakistan, you go to a, a lot of these different places. Uh, and when you go and you have the opportunity to meet uh, with the leaders, and you know, as a side note, uh, every once in a while, Parade Magazine, the supplement that comes out on Sunday morning, uh, the little insert in the paper, in your Sunday paper, uh, every once in a while, they'll have, on the cover, they'll have like, 20 of the most uh, dangerous or 20 of the worst people in the world. And you know, you kind of read it for interest. Uh, and one Sunday morning it came out and had the 20 worst people in the world. And I'm kind of looking through the pictures and it's kind of like, oh, Musharraf, Pakistan. Hey, I've met with that guy. Gaddafi. Oh, I've met with him three times. Bashir Assad in Syria. I've met with him. Arafat. Uh, you know, in, in the Palestinian territories. I've met with him, Karimov, Uzbekistan. At which point in time, you kind of look at it and say, what kind of job do I have anyway where these are the people that I'm now engaged with and working with? Uh, but, you know, you're, these are the people that we're trying to figure out America's role in, a wor in the world dealing with these kinds of individuals and dealing with societies that look at these issues from a very, very different perspective than what America does. You know, we take, we take a lot of things for granted. We have the opportunity in America to recognize that if we have an issue that has to go through the courts, by and large, Americans expect that the courts will give them a, a fair hearing. You go to Ukraine and you meet with the American Chamber of Commerce and you, they talk about the legal system in the Ukraine. And it's, they say, Pete, it's very simple. The legal system in the Ukraine is if you're a Ukrainian company taking an American company to court, the law is very clear. The, U the Ukrainian company wins, you lose. That's the rule of law in Ukraine. You go to a place in Nigeria, you go to other countries of the world, and you can't expect a fair hearing in the courts because the systems are corrupt. And so that's a prism that you have to factor in how you're going to deal and how you're going to develop a role for the United States dealing with these types of countries. In America, we've got a relatively short history, a little over 200 years as a country. You go into some of these parts of the world and they talk to you about the relationship between
between this tribe and that tribe, or this part of the country and that part of the country, in terms of what happened 600 years ago, not what happened last year, uh, or what the current dynamics are. You're talking about the dynamics of hundreds of years ago. You are talking about borders that were formed and countries that were formed uh, based on, on edicts by other countries where we've put together groups of tribes and people that normally you wouldn't put into the same country at all. And so as you take a look at these types of things of culture, history, the time, and all of these types of things, you recognize that anybody who comes out and says, this is the answer, they're probably not telling you the truth. Because this is important, and it's also very, very hard as we try to put those things in, in context and define America's role. The elements of leadership, as we take a look forward, the elements of leadership are fairly, clear, fairly clearly I, uh, outlined. You know, the Cold War, as I talked about it before, in the Cold War we had a relatively strong vision as to what we wanted to do. And Herman Miller, we said uh, the career, you know, what we used to talk about leadership is what a leader establishes a vision. They bring qualified people on board. They get these people to understand and buy the vision. And then they make sure these people have the tools. And then they get out of the way. And amazing things will happen. In America, much of, the, much of that is, is, is very true. If, if we develop a strong vision, a coherent vision, as to who we are, get our leadership our people to embrace that vision, to understand it, uh, and we may be, and then we give them the tools and then we get out of the way, it may be amazing as to what we will experience in a new era of American leadership. As I said, my belief is that America is still struggling with who we are and what we want to become, who we want to be in the world community in the aftermath of 9-11. Like I said, I don't want to make this partisan because I think under the Bush administration we struggle with this. Under the Obama administration we struggle with this. Uh, and it's because we haven't had a civil, constructive dialogue among us as a nation as to what that should be. We're kind of, we backed into a strategy immediately after 9-11. We got involved in things that, you know, created massive divisions uh, within the country. You know, everybody I think was pretty much in agreement that after 9-11, we, we needed to go into Afghanistan, go after Al-Qaeda, remove the Taliban, and eliminate a safe haven. That had significant support. It didn't define who we were and what we were going to become as a nation. It didn't really define the threat of radical jihadism, man-made disasters, whatever term that you wanted to use, it didn't define the threat. We then found out that you know, we, the, the strategy evolved into a strategy of going into Iraq, which will long be debated as to whether that was or was not the right thing to do. And you know, that strategy evolved, well, you know, we've got to go there because they've got WMD. Uh, it then evolved into, well, you, know, you want to liberate the people. And then it evolved into, well, you've got to go there because it's destabilizing in the Middle East. Uh, and then it evolved into, well, you know, Al-Qaeda is there and all of those kinds of things. And it wasn't a clear-cut consensus either in Congress or among the American people. There, it was for a short period of time, but it wasn't a lasting commitment uh, within 
the American people that it was an absolutely essential thing that we needed to be committed to for the long run. And so the end result is since we didn't have that long-term commitment and buy-in, the end result has been that, you know, really since 2005, 2006, <clears throat> because we have not defined America's role in the world, we have been bitterly divided as a nation on a whole series of, in, of issues. It is, we've been divided on foreign policy, we have been divided on domestic policy, we have been divided on economic policy, uh, and we, we end up, because we don't have a common vision of who we are, where we're going, and how we're going to get there, that we've had a dysfunctional discourse as to who we are and what we're doing because we don't have a unifying understanding as to what we're going to be and what we're going to become as a nation. Let me just highlight a few things that I think you know, we need to take a look at and that we have to have a discussion on and a better understanding on as we move towards defining who we will, who we are, and what our role will be as a nation. What our role will be internationally. This, these are the kinds of things that we have to talk about. We need to have a common understanding, a common framework for trying to understand what the threat is that we face today as a country. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, we've talked about, you know, there, you know under, under the Bush era, uh, it was, you know, clearly the term radical jihadism, um, radical Islam was a discussion, you know, were the words that were frequently used. Some people thought that that was appropriate. Others thought that that was too harsh. They thought that it condemned a religion. Um, and you know, there, there was a lot of, been a lot of dialogue around that. Uh, when the uh, Obama administration came into power, you may remember, and I think she probably regrets that she said this, she used, uh, Janet Napolitano used the words, I think she, it was her who used the term man-made disaster. Those, those are the threats that we need to worry about. Uh, that didn't add much clarity or much substance to the discussion. Uh, more recently, it's uh, you know terrorism and those types of things. But the bottom line is the political leadership hasn't had the dialogue. They haven't provided a clear enough vision to the American people that we have some understanding of who the threat is and what the scope of the threat is. How many of you have heard different analyses about the strength and the potential impact of Al-Qaeda or radical jihadism? Uh, one day you hear that you know, the threat has been you know, pretty significantly eliminated and it has been minimized, and that it's you know, now numbers in, in, in the hundreds uh, rather than thousands of people, and they're isolated in Pakistan, uh, a, a few in Afghanistan, and you know, that's about it. Uh, others will describe the threat as being much more significant as being, you know, that, that's a part of the threat that we face. Then you've got Al-Qaeda radical jihadism uh, elements in the Arabian Peninsula, primarily headquartered uh, in Yemen on the border with Saudi Arabia. It's a threat to the Arabian Peninsula, but it's run by an American, Al-Awlaki, who poses a threat because his target is attacking the U.S. homeland. Then you've got the elder elements of Al-Qaeda, radical jihadism uh, in northern Africa, uh, the Maghreb. And you know, that's another part combined with a threat from homegrown terrorism. And you all of a sudden see you know, that there's, we haven't reached a consensus as to what the threat is.